Hello and welcome back. Today we will be doing a bit of starting steps slash how to get rid of the sick man of Europe for the Ottoman Empire here. In this video we'll be dis discussing several things. We'll be discussing the Tanzimat reforms which are necessary to get rid of the sick man of Europe which gives you some negative modifiers. We'll be discussing a method for reforming the Ottoman Empire that seems to be at least at the very very beginning of the game better than corn laws and we will also be talking about early industrialization which is essential for doing the urbanization entry for Tanzimat and finally we will be discussing expansion in addition to kind of you know playing the opening moves here for the Ottoman Empire this will likely be a series it might be one to three videos uh, we'll see how quickly we can get through it uh, but the first thing we need to talk about is in fact the Tanzimat reforms. So the purpose of the Tanzimat reforms is to get rid of the sick man of Europe uh, modifier. Now you have the modifier here, which has negative prestige, and you also have uh, some modifiers over here in terms of outmoded bureaucracy, uh, which gives negative bureaucracy and negative taxation capacity. I believe if you do uh, just the bureaucratic reform, you get rid of this, so that's something to note. And we also have the size tax, which gives a plus religious tax and minus conscriptable battalions. And this is, uh, I don't know if it's either good or bad. Um, generally, flat taxing pops is not as good as taxing the upper rung pops specifically, and so this is not necessarily good, but money at the very start of the game is very good while you're trying to ramp up construction, so that's a bit of a mixed bag. And then we have the minus prestige, uh, in addition to kind of avoiding becoming derecognized. Right now, we're a major power. If we fail the sick man of Europe, we will be demoted to an unrecognized major power, and so this is the main reason why it's very important to not to fail this journal entry although there are ways to become recognized that are not the very worst and so it's not the end of the world uh but going into it uh we will be going for four of these six reforms because we have to complete four. Uh, we're going to kind of be working towards five, but the first one we're going to talk about is education reform. In 1.2, this was bugged. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still bugged. We're not going to be going for it as a result of this kind of thing, uh, but it involves increasing the literacy rate by 20%, which is actually pretty difficult uh, to do, and so we're just going to ignore it, especially because uh, it is difficult for us to pass any type of school at the start of the game, uh, except for religious schools, uh, without us kind of, you know, dedicating a lot of resources and law passes towards this sort of thing and we don't really want religious schools and so uh we're going to kind of put this in the back pocket as it were the second one we're going to maybe not do uh because we only have to do four out of six so we can kind of not do f two of them is reclaim syria we are going to try and do the strategy in such a way that it's going to be more consistent and one of the elements of being more consistent is uh, sometimes the diplomatic situation is just such that reclaiming Syria is not um, what you can do um, and so we are going to try and conduct the strategy in such a way that we don't absolutely need to reclaim Syria in order to be, um, you know, in order for things to work out. Uh, next up is going to be urbanization, which is actually going to change up uh, what our strategy is for the Ottomans more than any other. Uh, and this requires us to have, of all the Ottoman states, uh, they have to be incorporated and have an urban center at least 75%. And what this is going to do is, first of all, you don't want to grab states, generally speaking. Uh, we're probably, we might grab one state as part of our strategy, depending on how expansion goes. But other than that, uh, before we finish this reform, we're not looking to grab states. And secondly, every place needs to have an urban center. Now you get an urban center by having 100 urbanization. Uh, you can see how much urbanization the state has if it already has an urban center by coming in here. We see that there's 130 urbanization in Northern Thrace. Um, you get urbanization by building buildings. Uh, wheat farms or any type of farm gives, oh, I believe it gives five per level. It does get five per level, so this sees plus 10 uh, for the wheat farm. You get plus uh, 10 per level for uh, resource industries, and it's important to note, it takes twice as long to build a resource industry than a farm, so it's the same rate, but it gives plus 20 for most of your manufactories, uh, which take three times as much as a wheat farm. So in terms of efficiency for, you know, doing this Tanzimat reform or urbanizing, the most efficient thing is going to be manufacturing. And on top of that, uh, stuff like steel mills, and I believe motor industries uh, gives a 30 urbanization per level instead of 20. And so our strategy, instead of building tall and putting down decrees, uh, you know, encourage manufacturing and encourage resource industry, which we do with almost every other country, we are going to instead be building wide and using our authority in different ways, notably, uh, to bolster the intelligentsia and the industrialists, but more on that later. 
We have suppressed separatism. Um, we just have to keep secession movements from progressing more than 50%. Uh, generally speaking, this means that uh, running max taxes is a little bit risky. And also, you just pick the events that do that piss off the fewest amount of pops, specifically pops that are discriminated uh, against. You want to avoid pissing off the orthodox pops uh, because they're already going to be matched because they're orthodox. Uh, but other than that, this generally kind of completes itself. Uh, we have army mar modernization, which requires us to kind of have all of our uh, battalions uh, away from irregular and infantry focus and uh, not having cannon artillery. I'm not 100% sure. I believe this used to, in 1.1, uh, require you to do conscription centers and that now it does not require conscription centers, but we're going to be looking to get professional army anyways. And so if it requires we go into cannon artillery in the conscription centers, this won't be a problem. But it is important to note that if it does require the conscription centers, peasant levies won't cut it because we can't put on cannons with peasant levies. So just an important one to note, we're just going to hope that Napoleonic warfare natural spreads to us and try and avoid having to go for it in particular. Um, it will natural spread eventually because tier one techs will spread first and so we don't have to worry too, too much. This one will just require us to, you know, build up the military uh, another five battalions because currently at the start of the game you have 145. So this is not a big deal. And and finally, this is going to be one of the more challenging ones. We have Tanzimat bureaucratic reforms, which requires we get rid of hereditary bureaucrats and land-based taxation. And specifically for all of this, we are in a bit of trouble, a bit of a pickle, uh, because the landowners are so strong and they're very, very strong uh, with the Ottoman Empire and they are uh, passing laws is a lot harder in 1.3. And so what we have to do is we have to kneecap the landowners and specifically they're getting a ton of extra clout from slavery and from serfdom right? Uh, which is not present at a lot of countries at the start of the game. In addition to, you know, monarchy giving them additional uh, uh, clout, autocracy, if I'm not mistaken, gives it to aristocrats, uh, which generally go landowner oriented. And luckily we don't have, you know, local police, uh, which is something, but peasant levies also empowers them. And so we have just a ton of laws, almost all the laws uh, that empower specifically the landowners. And so we have to curtail them in order to make it easier for the car to be loud outside. In order to make it easier for us to get onto appointed bureaucrats, we're going to have to curtail or get some sort of, you know, reformer here. Um, and also, you know, in order to be able to switch the tax up a little bit from land-based taxation to per capita. Um, we are not going to go for proportional straight off the bat um, because there's too much tech to get through. And we will, Tanzimat will time out before we can get egalitarianism given, you know, our, our overall strategy. And so this is just like a quick overview of all the Tanzimat and reforms and kind of how we're thinking about them we should be able to do pretty much all of them except for education reform uh but we are going to do a strategy that makes it so we don't have to reclaim syria although we would love to reclaim syria uh because it's rightfully our dirt now i know what you're thinking better than corn laws this guy's crazy uh well there's a better way than corn laws. The reason why corn laws is not very good anymore here in 1.3 is it's so hard to pass, specifically if you are a large country. If you're a small country, it's relatively easy. Uh, but if you're a large country, this plus 25% expense is actually really hard to raise up. And the reason why is because you have subsistence farms that are producing uh, a ton of grain over the course of your, you know, larger empire. Now, this is exacerbated by one of the very things that you really, really want corn laws for, which is getting rid of serfdom specifically um serfdom uh what it does is it gives a pm that actually produces even more grain which is you know kind of in under rare circumstances is useful but this pm here we have free peasants and serfdom serfdom will produce more grain which further makes it harder to activate corn laws the reason why corn laws was so good is you could get it basically at the very start of the game and you could start reforming immediately and it was just chef's kiss and so what we want now is the ability to get something close to the start of the game which allows us to reform we could still get corn laws but it would be a delayed sort of thing several years down the road and we'd be like reforming and we'd get it, our market liberal and we'd start doing this stuff and it's just too slow now i think in particular if you're doing larger countries the what you want to do is you want to kind of just kind of get your industrialist strong enough um which kind of sucks but it is what it is but with ottomans specifically and I believe this is because they start out with a moderate local governor or landowner uh, IG guy. Specifically with them, there's another thing you can do. 
If we exile the dissident, which we can't do because he's part of the government right now, so we need to pull him out of government, now he's a dissident, and so now we can exile him. When we exile him, his ideology will change. Right now, he's spineless. He doesn't have a stance on anything. If we exile him, he will grow a spine and he will gain an ideology. Now, it is not always abolitionist. Sometimes it's, you know, Republican. Sometimes it's this. Sometimes it's that. You can get pacifist, Republican, abolitionist. Generally, it seems to be whatever is reactionary uh, to your current law set. But now we have this abolitionist, but he's not in our country, so why is he useful? In fact, we just got a jingoist who got promoted. Uh, notably, this guy's probably one of our uh, leaders in terms of our army or our admiral. Uh, maybe he's not. He is not, but this is something that's important to note. When you exile someone, often it selects from your landowners, or sorry, from your uh, generals or your navy. So this is important to keep in mind when recruiting. If we wanted to try and game the system some other way, we could try and recruit specifically people who have ideologies we want, like jingoist, let's say here, or royalist here. But back to the point, um, we can invite the guy we just exiled. Now he was a moderate before, now he has a spine, and now we can invite him back. And so now we have an agitator who is an abolitionist. Abolitionists are actually quite good because if we take a look, what do they support? Ah, uh, banning slavery, of course. And also they strongly oppose serfdom, the very thing we really, really want to get rid of uh, so that we can do better economic laws uh, after the start of the game so we can go interventionist or laissez-faire or interventionalism as laissez-faire. So, what are we going to do now? Well, he's just an agitator. Well, you can promote him to government. And so what we'll do is we'll promote him to government to replace this guy. We have to put this guy back in government first. And then we're going to come in. And then we're going to come in. And then we're going to come in. And we are going to grant this guy leadership of the party. Because now the party's in government. So now they're in charge. And now we have an abolitionist uh, in charge of the local governors with a whopping 60% clout. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to get rid of slavery and we're going to get rid of serfdom. We're going to start with serfdom. We're going to go for homesteading, which is going to feel big nice. And then we're going to go get rid of slave trade. Uh, now, it's important to note there is a cooldown on exiling people, so you can't just keep exiling or whatever. Uh, like, if we were to take a look here, we can't exile this guy for... Uh, several years for five years so there's a five-year cooldown but you can use this to try and get people who are reactionary or to try and kick problematic people out uh, so that you can try and move in the right direction an example would be we would love to have like uh, a market liberal type guy or this sort of stuff if we could eventually get it I don't even think we can roll one before we have uh, I forget which one of these texts but I believe stock exchange might be the one that allows market liberals to spawn so we can't even spawn one anyways uh, but back to the point uh, the main point of this is we now have this guy, this abolitionist, who's going to let us get rid of serfdom and slavery at the very start, which is going to get rid of this plus 50%. And this plus 50% landowner strength, which is going to allow us to pass all the other laws that we need to pass. Uh, specifically, we need to change the tax law and we need to change the bureaucrat law for Tans and Matt. But we also want to get rid of serfdom, slavery, and traditionalism. And so this is going to kind of help us along our way for those specifically. And unlike corn laws... We can do it before we be even unpaused. It's faster than corn laws uh, for getting rid of these two. Not for doing the economic system, but once we kneecap these boyos enough, yes, then we will be able to bring up the other groups. Um, you know, it would have been nice if there was a Republican uh, that we could also use. Maybe we can, in five years, look to try and get a Republican guy uh, so that we can, you know, use the local governors instead. I don't believe the other guy we replaced becomes an agitator. It doesn't seem that way. Uh, but this is going to allow us to, you know, have a nice running start here with the Ottomans. Diplo, authority, and tech we've assigned in the following way. For Diplo, we have decided to improve relations with all the GPs, uh, or specifically Great Britain, France, Austria, and Russia, because eventually when we go for Egypt, we don't want any of them thumbing our pies. Uh, in order to facilitate this, we have rivaled both Spain and two Sicilies. Also important to note for the Ottomans specifically, you start off with a ri as a rival of uh, Russia, and so you need to remove that rivalry if you want to ev eventually develop positive relations, and this is going to be very, very, very important uh, because you don't obviously want a finger in your pie. For a 
authority, uh, we have decided to bolster the industrialists and the intelligentsia, which is something we haven't done too much of since patch 1.1. Um, but I think it's particularly strong for the Ottomans, uh, specifically, specifically because you're not making use of the edicts uh, for, you know, focusing in one place as a result of the urbanization Tanzimat reform. Now, again, the highest power Ottoman run you could possibly do would probably involve you ignoring Tanzimat urbanization and instead committing to you have to do the reclaim Syria one. But okay, uh, other than that, it is a bunch of consumption taxes just kind of looking into the consumption taxes. Uh, they are all luxury goods and they're the luxury goods that generate the most revenue. You want to do this because you would rather tax the upper strata because it has less of a negative effect on your SOL, which is going to be one of the drivers of literacy, which obviously is something we need a bit of help with. So this is going to be important. And for technology, uh, in particular for society, we want to go for both. Um, we want to go for currency standards because we want to be able to do per capita taxation. Often with a lot of countries that aren't as backward, you would want to go for egalitarianism, skip that kind of step and go directly for proportional taxation. But I think this is too far back and we need it for a Tanzimat reform. Secondarily, we're going for stock exchange. Uh, um, we want the uh, extra trade route uh, bureaucracy or the minus on the cost. There's a minus there. And also we want the extra trade route competitiveness. On top of this allows us to roll a market liberal and maybe we just be super lucky and handsome. And so that's our strategy here. Uh, it would be reasonable to go for colonization as well as maybe empiricism. But the main reason we're researching society tech first here uh, in the Ottoman Empire is because we have a guaranteed track that we are getting cotton gin and lathe. Now cotton gin and lathe are probably more important, but we can kind of sort of lock in the society society tech we want right now, knowing that these will not spread, and then we're going to do cotton gin and lathe next. Also, because we are spreading out and we have so many provinces, railways is not super essential early on. And so this is another reason why we've gone for some society tech first. We might, you know, make a little bit of an audible and go for colonization second instead um, or empiricism, this sort of stuff. But these are kind of the four techs we're eyeing in the society tree, even though we definitely want to get lathes kind of early on uh, because lathes is going to allow us to, you know, focus more on the manufactories, which is definitely what we want to do relative to the resources relative to most runs because we're trying to pull up the urbanization for tans and mat and so this is kind of the strategy for the resources and the tech for construction we've put in some construction centers and some logging camps and tooling workshops as a general strategy what we're going to be doing is we are going to be looking to build logging camps then build the tooling camps to be able to support the logging camps being sawmills as we expand the construction centers up to the point where we're going to be losing money a little bit and then we're going to try and transition to iron and slowly turn on all the iron frame buildings. Um, this is kind of the fastest way to expand construction on a per construction basis is with the wooden frame buildings. But then once you're losing money, uh, then you want to swap to the more efficient iron frame building ones. So this is going to be how we've done it. We also notably have taken efforts to place them in areas that currently have urban center uh or urbanization that is a multiple of, or that has ends in a five. The reason for this is that the construction centers add five urbanization per level. And so this, uh, since the manufacturers add a multiple of 10 and the mines add a multiple of 10 and we're not going to intentionally build agriculture, um, this helps to balance out and push the Tanzimat reform a little bit faster, probably unnecessary, but once we get rid of the urbanization reform, then we are more free to expand um, and actually take states because because this is based on all of our states. And so if we keep taking more states, we are not going to be able to do this. And so this is kind of the construction strategy in the beginning. Other than that, it's relatively standard, except it's not going to be centralized anywhere. So we're also going to look kind of in terms of resources. Uh, it would be a lot easier for us to make the iron frame swap if we could get into Austria's market. And so as far as trade routes go, as we need trade routes, uh, we are going to try and run them from Austria as much as possible and look to get into their market while we are still a major power uh once we become a great power this will no longer be possible um but it's uh it's also important to note once we swap our military pms up uh which is unnecessary to do at this point in time we're not going to do it uh even though we eventually need to do it for army modernization we want to uh once we do this, it will increase our prestige by enough that we probably won't be able to join a market, and so this will be difficult. Also, we might just be not be able to jo uh, 
join because we are already part of customs union actually yeah this is going to be a problem because we already have subjects and we don't want to annex them uh we cannot join someone else's market so scratch the joining someone else's market uh idea unless they send an invitation to us at which point we can join and so we will maybe just hope for one for austria but other than that it's going to be us against the world Speaking of us against the world, there's four expansion strategies, and I'm just going to go through explaining all of them, but we're only going to take one, obviously. Now, uh, they're partially informed by Tanzimat urbanization, which requires that of all the states we own, uh, they have to be incorporated and have to have an urban center. So it is preferable that we actually don't annex land uh, until we get Tanzimat urbanization out of the way. And so what the strategies are, are first of all, um, you know, the tried and uh, true going through South Africa, getting after Transvaal, and and Oranye, uh, however it's pronounced. I think I got it a little bit better. Um, the idea is they have a bunch of gold here. These are pretty good states to take. Unfortunately, uh, they are going to be 20 year incorporations, so they we will not be able to use them for urbanization. And so this will slow it down a little bit. Another one is puppeting Bolivia relatively early, um, but Olivia, uh, Bolivia in particular will pull off our Greek pops. We do have discriminated uh, you know, Greek population uh, that will and Bulgarians, which will look to migrate to Bolivia, but it is a pretty good uh, opener in terms of puppeting them. The reason being is it only takes like 11 infamy. Eventually they unite with uh, Peru anyways, and you get both of them for very cheap. And so I think this is one of the strongest kind of openers that you can engage in. Uh, also, going after Persia. Now, Persia is uh, always a pretty good dominion, but it's an especially good dominion target for the Ottomans because you accept um, a lot of these cultures here, so they are quick incorporations. And so going after Persia is probably what I would recommend for most people, but we are going to do the relatively high variance, a high risk, high reward type play, and that is going after Great Shane. And I know what you might be thinking, Great Shane, you can't possibly fight them. That's correct. We cannot uh, fight them 1v1. Um, but what we can do is we can wait for uh, the UK to declare on Great Shing, and then we declare on Great Shing, we piggyback their war, and we are going to go for a province. And I know what you might be thinking. Uh, you said don't go for provinces, General. This province is worth it. The idea being, we could actually probably make use decent use of this uh, government administration, because we're already running a negative balance, but putting that aside... Um, we are looking for the Forbidden City. We have to pass a ton of laws, and the Forbidden City gives us plus 20 legitimacy from including the head of state and government, which allows the laws to pass faster. Um, you know, we have so many laws to get through, and so this will be very useful. On top of that, uh, we can get war reparations from Great Shing. The generally, you could even declare weird wars for Great Shing, like getting a treaty port in Formosa. There was another YouTuber, uh, We Play Games, who suggested this one specifically. But any war against Great Shing, uh, where you just take war reps off of them, is really good because war reps is a function of how loud the cars are outside. It's a function of how high the GDP is, and when you have a higher GDP, you pay more in war reps even though great shing's gdp is almost entirely from uh you know their subsistence farms right this is where their gdp is coming from which doesn't really empower their country they don't have enough tax capacity they're not really utilizing the gdp but they have an enormous gdp and so that means their war reps are absolutely huge and if we can pick off war reps from them then we can just blast construction and we can finish the tanzimat urbanization very 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 quickly uh in time to kind of go after egypt hopefully maybe not that fast uh but the faster we do that the faster it's good for us to go after egypt because again we're going to acquire new states when we go after egypt which is going to put us behind on urbanization specifically and so this is kind of the expansion plan i think the consistent one is going after persia now russia might not like this russia is generally pretty belligerent and so you got to keep that in mind and be able to bob and weave um might require some restarts and or loading uh but it's the very start of the game so you know it's pretty easy to uh kind of make that move uh right now at least at the start here and so we get homesteading relatively quickly it only took us four ticks to get it uh one of the ticks was just gave us a higher percentage chance and we get homesteading and it is important to note while we have this abolitionist we absolutely have to make a move for abolishing slavery right now because we have enormous chance to pass it also this entire time we have been watching great shing's diplomacy screen if you want the more min maxed version you should probably take one of the, your subjects as a puppet as an opener but we haven't declared any wars yet we've just 
just been watching uh, for the UK to declare war here. And as soon as they do, we're going to piggyback on the same war and declare at the same time so that we can utilize the UK beating up the Great Shing for us to be able to beat up Great Shing. You got to kick them while they're down. So the UK finally puts a war in. Now we have to declare neutrality here before we can declare war on China ourselves. So we'll declare neutrality and then we will go straight for Beijing and war reparations as our goals. Uh, now we might want to put in release someone. Um, we can kind of do either one. Uh, notably, it's a very nice that there doesn't appear to be Russia in an interest here in North China, uh, which means we won't get our pie fingered, at least by them. We'll take war reparations as well. Uh, we might make this primary. There's a few things we can do. Also notably, uh, the industrialists have just had to come up. They have finally become demarginalized, which is going to be super nice because it's going to increase capitalist investment pool contribution efficiency, which we don't have a ton of capitalists right now, but we're going to be moving in that direction shortly. And so this will greatly affect, you know, our investment pool growing. Now we can't really untap or unlock our investment pool until we go uh, and get off of traditionalism, which is big what we want. We might even make a move for romanticism into agrarianism. This wouldn't be the terriblest uh, because uh, currently we have, it increases aristocrat and farmer contribution. It decreases capitalist contribution efficiency, but it decreases it by a smaller margin than this one. And so maybe we do some sort of skip over to agrarianism if it doesn't look like we can, you know, go after either a new tax system specifically or after hereditary bureaucrats, which we need for the Tanzimat Reformation. But this war should be really easy. Uh, we will just recruit another admiral and then we will look to double land or triple land Beijing at the same time the UK is or right after the UK does. Uh, that way we will be able to get an enforcement and they are also going to be suffering a ton of casualties in the UK war, which if I'm not mistaken, it counts for our war too. So that's big nice. So contrary to normal form, the UK has but done basically nothing in this war. Uh, and hasn't managed to make any progress and has only attempted and then somehow failed a landing in South China. Uh, so we have been doing it ourselves. We tried landing multiple times in Beijing, hoping that we would kind of link up with the UK, but no progress there. And instead, uh, we are getting, we are trying to double land uh, Upper Manchuria to pull all their troops there so we can get a landing, a single landing down here so we can get a foothold in Beijing and try and enforce that way. This is going to be very painful. We're going to lose a lot of people. Um, you probably won't encounter as uh, incompetent a UK in your runs because we've done this tons of times and the UK has never had this much trouble uh, but we're doing it the hard way and you know we still have a lot of infamy uh, we're still decaying and so it's not too big a deal that we're stuck in this war way longer than we should be but we're losing a lot of boyos also we're trying to ramp out the construction still um, this is kind of one of the things we're doing uh, we're gonna be switching more iron frames more iron frames more iron frames we're making a little bit too much money right now and we need to look at that and look to up construction specifically trying to spread stuff out to get urban centers to level one everywhere so we get slavery banned which is big nice also what's nice is our landowner's super happy with us right now uh because he's an abolitionist and we've just passed a bunch of stuff that he likes uh and it's been super easy and so i think we're gonna be make a little bit of a play here on appointed bureaucrats the reason being is we do want to come off of uh specifically traditionalism uh but we cannot yet kind of get the industrial in government while having it look very good yet uh, maybe we could do this a little bit we want the industrialists to come up a little bit more and so we'll take a couple shots like hereditary bureaucrats um, before you know focusing more on the economic system because we do have to get rid of uh, hereditary bureaucrats and also reform the tax system uh, which the landowners also won't like and maybe this would actually be a little bit better we do have the technology we would have to put again the either the industrialists or the armed forces in government let's actually take a quick look can we become legitimate looking with the armed forces in it doesn't quite look like it so we'll shelf that for now we'll try and see if we can do appointed bureaucrats but we'll probably only take uh, a couple ticks off uh, before reevaluating the situation because the intelligentsia is not very big and so it's going to be a little bit hard to pass the china war is going okay um it looks like we're going to be able to decay them below zero Hopefully we do not have to reland Manchuria and that this is enough that we can hold off here. We have a huge minus, but we have stronger military PMs and we're stuck in there now. Uh, after landing Manchuria, doing double landings to get up in there to divert all their troops up there so we could double land back down here. Um, it's been a bit of a tough one. UK is still nowhere in sight, uh, which is uh, big incompetent on their part. 
So it looks like they'll accept a piece for Beijing and War Reps. Um, you know, perhaps if we were looking to play a longer campaign, we would be more, care more about liberating Mongolia. But for now, this is going to give us a lot of what we want. It will allow us to start a new war, probably for Bolivia, which will be nice uh, because they still haven't incorporated Peru yet. And so that'll be fairly efficient uh, a take. And also maybe expanding elsewhere. We're not going to try and take any states other than Beijing. So we'll just propose the peace deal and we'll look as... Uh, this Diplo Pact gives us plus 35k now from these war reps, which are going to be big, huge. And also we have this, the Forbidden City, which is giving us authority and legitimacy from including the head of state in government. The head of state is in government, and so we are going to be bumped up here uh, in part by the, uh, you know, the... I think it still needs to wait 20 uh, or wait till next Monday in order to incorporate that 20. Let's just let it think for a second. Eh. We should be getting the legitimacy. Maybe we are not getting it because they are not connected to the market because they don't have a port, which is a bit of an interesting thing. Uh, we will have to, of course, put a port in. Now we have a ton of excess bureaucracy. Um, we're not going to... I don't think we're going to run down these at government administrations. We might. Um, but right now, because we kind of want uh, excess bureaucracy, because we're going to be passing laws that stick in a little bit more demands on our institutions. We don't have any institutions right now. And so long term, this would be kind of good. But now we can absolutely blast out construction uh, really, really, really aggressively. And this is exactly what we're going to do on the back of these war reps here. So we're going to take a single tick here on the appointed bureaucrats and let's see if we get something that looks good at all. We actually get this interesting one where we have a ton of bureaucracy and we can get some uh, enactment time and enactment chance so we're going to stick with it. Had we not rolled a good event, what we would have done is we would have popped, you know, the industrialists in government with this 53% which is in part boosted. I think it's boosted. The tooltip is uh, not the best. Let's see, we're getting plus 70 from the head of state, uh, the intelligentsia being in government, which is, uh, it, it is bonus because we're getting bonus from the monarchy. We're getting 20 here. Uh, we are getting 50 from autocracy or we're getting 30 from uh, autocracy here. So that's plus 50. And then we're getting an additional 20 from the forbidden city. So plus 70. And that's where our really relatively high legitimacy is coming from. Uh, I think this is going to be where we conclude the episode uh, because it seems like a good time. Uh, we have done uh, a big chunk of explaining the Tanzimat reforms and how we are going to be approaching them. We've been working to expand construction. If you notice, we added a whole bunch because we now we are getting the war reps from China. And on a per construction basis, wood frame buildings are better at adding construction, but they are not as efficient on a monetary basis, uh, especially as uh, the iron frame buildings. The problem with iron frame buildings is you need to build a lot of iron in order to not run shortages and wood frame is supported by subsistence farms. The outputs of subsistence farms which output both wood and fabric. And so this is why you can expand on a per construction basis faster with wood frame. So we've been doing that and all the other buildings we've been building, we've been building with a sensitivity to the fact that we are trying to get 100 urbanization in different areas. And so we are not building tall anywhere. So for example, we have, you know, uh, coal in here. We do need to do increase the demand for coal right now. Uh, that's the problem here. We need to turn on in more urban centers uh, the lights, as it were, uh, for gas street lights. They're on in a couple places. Um, we have also you know, explain some uh, expansion plans. Specifically, we went for Beijing, which is uh, relatively high variance. We managed to get it without any help from, uh, you know, Great Britain, who has managed to do nothing. Uh, they have not landed anywhere, uh, which is very unusual, really low roll on variance, but it does go to show you can do this with the Ottomans with zero help from Great Britain um, for, to Great Qing at the very beginning. Once Great Qing gets some PMs rolling, you're going to have a hard time, but before then, it's good. What our strategy was well, first we failed to land Beijing a whole bunch of times because we were expecting the UK to be landing. We thought we would be landing simultaneously with the UK, but they never came. And so instead we adopted the strategy of multiple landings with multiple navies. You know, we have three different boyos here uh, so that we could, you know, bypass their navy into Upper Manchuria, which is much less defended. We stick all of our guys in Upper Manchuria. Once they match our guys with all of their guys, then we can land Beijing because no one's defending the landings anymore. 
they have too many troops uh, for us to tie them all up in a single go. And the reason why is uh, your combat width is based on infrastructure, and they have like 1k troops. And so even if 100 get in, uh, you know, on them, or 100 of ours, or 100 to 200 of theirs is active, we would need like 7 armies to fully land them if they're all defended here. But since they were all up here, we could get in. And once we were in, we were stuck in like a tick. Um, and they couldn't push us off in time. They were slowly pushing us back, but it doesn't matter. We enforce, we get a ton of money. Um, and then finally, what we also did is we showed that uh, you can use an agitator, the new agitator mechanic to do something that's basically better than corn laws, at least for the Ottomans. I think it requires having someone who has a moderate ideology, but we just exiled and we got an abolitionist. You can keep re-rolling until you get an abolitionist for the Ottomans um, and you can keep re-rolling. So we exiled the guy from government. He went from being a moderate to the abolitionist and then we brought him back in through the exiled agitator mechanic and then once he was in we promoted him to back to the government we swapped the local governors back in and once they were back in then we were able to take the agitator and promote him into the government and so this is kind of how we have managed to really kneecap the landowners in just the first three years because we have banned slavery and we have gone homesteading which is really good for kneecapping them because it gives rural folk political strength instead of tenant farmers giving local governors political strength so this is really 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 big we're going for hereditary bureaucrats now but we will see their clout overall continue to fall uh, from the local governors especially as we look to pass other things and we can pass things they hate as long as this guy doesn't die uh, because uh, he's super happy with us now because we've gotten rid of slavery and he's big happy about that and so this is kind of a, a, a strong approach just starting off for doing the Ottomans and moving through the Tanzimat. Also, we're just getting poised to do a war against Egypt where we can turn on all of our PMs and definitely afford it. Uh, we just have to make sure we play a little bit of the Diplo game uh, because Russia big doesn't like us. They're still belligerent and we don't want them to join in against us. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and you found it helpful, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. It does help out. And other than that, have a good day.